It's the first day of November, 1976. Despite the childish alertness, Bradley Austin, 40 months old, is desperately ill. Never mind. Here comes. This is the story of the next 10 days in his young life. That delicate blue tinge on his lips indicates a malformed heart. In fact, it's a wonder that is alive. When three days old, he was on the brink of death. As a three-day-old, he was rushed into the paediatric unit at London's Brompton Hospital. A catheter, a long, thin tube, was inserted into a vein in the groin and guided upwards. It needed patience and dexterity, but eventually the tube entered the heart itself. Then a radio-opaque dye was pumped through it and the blood flow could be seen. It indicated that Bradley's heart was malformed. For survival, a temporary operation was imperative. Another catheter was inserted into the heart and inflated. Fully blown up, it was jerked backwards to tear a hole in the inner wall. This hole allows Bradley's blood to mingle just sufficiently to keep him alive. Now, in the case of Bradley Austin, as we've explained to you uh, previously, he has transposition of the great arteries, where the main artery to the body and the main artery to the lungs come off the wrong pumping chambers. Elliot Scheinborn was the paediatrician in charge of the earlier operation. Fourteen months later, on day two, the 2nd of November 1976, he explained the situation to Bradley's parents. Transposition means that Bradley's blue blood, the blood with impurities, never reaches the lungs. It simply passes through the heart and recirculates round his body. Extraordinarily, Bradley's heart is connected the wrong way round. His red blood, containing oxygen, never reaches the body. It's just pumped back to the lungs. It never feeds Bradley's brain or limbs. Only that temporary measure, the gash made in the wall, allowed Bradley to survive to undergo further complex surgery. And this operation, which is called a mustard operation, a piece of material must be inserted into the heart to form two distinct tubes. One channels Bradley's blue blood to the lungs to be reoxygenated as normal. And goes to the lungs. And at the same time as ensuring that the blue... The other diverts red blood so that oxygenated blood is pumped around the body. It's by no means an easy operation. There is a risk. That is, a, this is a big operation on a little baby. And uh, there is a chance, although it's small, that he may not come through. However, having said that, we would be extremely perturbed if he did not come through very smoothly. He's in very able hands. Yes, Stephen's an 11 day old baby who was admitted. Children of all nationalities are sent here. Yes, can you get him undressed as we're talking? With a history of as knowledge increases and techniques improve, the patients get younger and younger. Five years ago, the chances facing the 500 children with deformed hearts passing through the unit every year were poor. Now, the doctors expect an exceedingly high success rate, about 93%. To them, the secret of the unit is teamwork. Great delicacy is required from physicians and nursing staff. Attention to detail by each member of the unit. Recourse to all available data and research. In this unit, they're always collecting data for possible future use. On day three, the electrical signals across the surface of Bradley's heart are recorded. By taking this record and comparing it with all those previously taken, a pattern may emerge, a pattern to save future lives. Like the pattern of the heart's electrical wiring made up of these circular heart cells. 
Bob Anderson, an anatomist with the unit, has now found peculiarities between their route through the heart. Well, this is a post-muster transposition, and you can see that there's... Pulmonary. This heart is formed in the same way as Bradley's. Until recently, it's been rare for children with these hearts to survive, but those earlier fatalities now help Bob Anderson in understanding malformed hearts, particularly the positioning of the wiring system. In that place. Yes. Okay. His technique has been to fix each heart with wax and then slice it into incredibly thin slivers. Dyes are imparted to show up the different types of tissue in the heart. He's building a blueprint of a malformed heart and tracing its wiring, the root of the signal carrying tissues which the surgeon must avoid. Tie those tissues and the patient will die. Under the microscope, stringy muscle cells can be seen, but he searches out the special circular tissues that carry the electrical signals. There they are, and he repeats the process with each sliver. The technician from a Liverpool research centre now takes over. She traces in each strand of wiring that Anderson has identified. It's slow, painstaking work. But for Bradley, his chances in the operating theatre could well depend upon isolating those roots in his type of heart. Each section of every known type of malformed heart has been built up in this way. Eventually, the unit has a model of this particular kind of heart, a model which the surgeon could examine, a model on which the blue line indicating every twist and turn of the heart's electrical wiring is clearly visible. Day four, the surgical team bring in the anaesthetized patient. The time for surgery has arrived. The operation starts by packing ice round that tiny body. Its temperature is brought lower and lower. When the body is sufficiently cooled, the chest is opened up and the process of making the heart inoperative begins. Wet news, please. For surgery as delicate as this, the heart must be absolutely static. Life continues through a heart-lung machine. Bradley's blood is bypassed through it. His own blood pressure reaches a steady level. Keep it the normal temperature. And the heart's pumping is reduced. Okay. Two newts. Uh, give me a 25. Please. Now that tiny malformed heart is opened and explored. First, they must locate the heart's wiring system. Using an electric probe, the surgeon searches. If Bradley's heart is like the model of the other heart, it's around here. The oscilloscope verifies it. You've got it. The surgeon is pre-warned. Okay. Uh, flush the coronary, Danny, now. Flushing coronary. Now the temperature of that young body must be reduced further still. Wide open. OK, hold it. Stop. Right. Trickle. A full 10 degrees. And before putting in Bradley's new plumbing system, the blood flow through the heart must be stopped completely. The surgeon applies a clamp. Ruler to me. The inside of the heart is now probed and measured. Turn it round to centimetres. We're in the common market now, thank you very much. Each dimension must be accurately ascertained. Two centimetres. The outline of the new plumbing system for a 14-month-old boy is slowly, painstakingly planned out onto the material. The kind of shape he's blocking out has been perfected over five years. Its development has increased enormously the success rate of the operation. Heart's not ejecting, is it? It's a strange shape, but it can be twisted and turned to form two tubes deep inside the heart chambers of a child.
Now, we've got to get that inside the heart, if you can believe that. Okay. Five years of perfecting many tiny details. It's only because of these improvements that this operation is now possible. This is the most difficult bit around this bottom end. See, we're in the depths of the left atrium here. We'll soon be emerging a bit. We hope we will. That material will remain in the heart forever. Tissue will grow over it. It will eventually be indistinguishable from the real heart material. How many minutes crossed, Clem? Uh, 13. Reduce the flow, please. Tell me at 15 minutes. OK. The tricky part is over. The tubes are in place. But the patient is still ice cold, dead to all intents and purposes. Defibrillate, please. An electric shock starts the heart again, and for the first time in 14 months, red blood starts to flow normally through Bradley's body. OK, Fax. But he's by no means out of danger. Day four is drawing to a close. It's the start of another highly dangerous period. The nursing team now takes charge. For the next 24 hours, they will interpret every movement Bradley makes. A movement could be quite insignificant, or it could alert the whole team. But for two people, there's a particular tension at this time. Um, uh, everything seems to be going quite well at the moment. Um, no problems during the operation. And uh, since he's come back, he's been doing all the right things, behaving himself. Um, yeah, can you come and hold his hand? He's a bit cold, but um, the children are always a little cold when they come back from theatre. Because, as you know, we have to cool them down. They're always kept fully informed. They're allowed access to their child whenever possible. The unit feels that's important. But now, they must just wait. He'll be kept fast asleep for tonight. Yeah. He's fast asleep. He's not mm. feeling anything. He gets sedation to make him breathe with the mm. ventilator, but he also gets pain. Pain and messing with his eyes. He feels something. That night, Bradley is watched over by another team in the unit. They're the electronic experts. Bradley is slowly emerging from a state of non-living and a whole battery of monitors is used to make sure that the emergence proceeds calmly. One of the most sensitive checks is picking up the minute variations in carbon dioxide levels in Bradley's breathing. The slightest variation and the alarm will be raised. Your eyes. Okay. Three days later, Bradley was out of the intensive care unit. And on day 10, the 11th of November, Bradley Austin was active again, and with his family. He differs in two ways from 10 days ago. The bluish tinge has gone. Here is some spot you are. And the signs are that he will lead a normal, healthy life.